there's nothing easier for the human mind than to start developing the conviction that one deserves all the goodies that one has. To consider whatever it is that we have accumulated, whether it's a few records in a record collection or a few trillion dollars, to consider this to be deservedly ours. And it is very easy at the same time, if you don't have any property, to begin to hate those who do. Firstly, we don't deserve what we have. If, we, if you have something, I say to my daughter, you have an iPhone, you have a laptop, you have this, it's the accident of birth. If you were born in a different family, you wouldn't have anything. It's got nothing to do with your um, deserving that. for adopting a neutral stance. It is a preposterous project because my friends used to be very proud of Irish neutrality. To be neutral does not mean to be a moral relativist. To take an equidistant position from hideous conflicts where there is clearly a perpetrator and a victim of a perpetrator. What neutrality means is that the people of Ireland have the opportunity to decide amongst themselves the merits of every case the justice or injustice of a particular war, instead of being railroaded into a collective position, which is not that of a commonwealth of independent and democratic states. Take Austria. Austria was a neutral state throughout the Cold War. Did that mean it took no sides? It did not take a moral position regarding, for instance, the invasion by the Soviet tanks of Prague and Czechoslovakia during the Prague Spring? No, it didn't. What it means is that you retain your sovereignty when it comes to matters of security, of peace, of war. When NATO takes a position, it is the will, the iron will of the United States, and not of the United States of America, not of the American people, but indeed of the American military industrial complex against which President Eisenhower, a Republican and a war hero, warned Americans against, let alone the Irish or the Greeks. Irish neutrality is a great virtue that you should guard with your lives. Now, let me turn to the question of the European Union and the rather lofty and touching faith that um, we all have a duty to bind together under the auspices of the European Commission and to participate in a common defense program, a common defense procurement program, primarily. Uh, this is all about commerce arms trades, and the idea that the European Union should create a common army. Remember what Gandhi said when he was asked once what he thought of British civilization? His answer was, sardonically, it would be a great idea. Similarly, the European Union would be a fantastic idea, except we don't have one. We have a confederacy of big business, big banking, and now of the military industrial complex of Germany, of France, and of Italy, competing against one another for huge defense contracts. They have nothing to do with the security of the French people, of the German people, indeed of the Ukrainian people. Imagine how low in the pecking order the interests of the Irish and the Greek people are. When the powers that be talk to us about the potential of a European army, let's say we formed an army, who would decide whether to send those men and women to the front line? To war. Who? Ursula von der Leyen, Mr. Borrell, Scholz, 
Macron, we don't have a legitimate, legitimizing government elected by European citizens, for European citizens, that decide matters of war and peace. So it would be preposterous to have a European army unless we have a federation. But who is talking about a federation? They are not talking about federation. They are talking about common procurement. That is, while denying Europeans a common health system, a common education system, a common migration policy, a common refugee policy, a common policy for treating human beings humanely, rather than pushing them back into the stormy seas of the Mediterranean and erecting hideous fences that only maximize the profits of the traffickers, but they are talking about common defense. This is all about money. Just follow the money. The Irish should stay away from this. The Greeks should stay away from this. The French should stay away from this. This has nothing to do with our defense. And in any case, friends, ever since the war in Ukraine started, that hideous war, which I personally condemned Putin for, I've been condemning Putin since he killed 250,000 Chechens in 2001, uh, when I was a very lone voice against Putin, calling him a criminal, when the rest of the West was doing brisk trade and business with him. At the very same time, NATO has utilized the Ukraine war to prolong it forever in order to ensure that whatever smidgen of European sovereignty there was has been surrendered to NATO and in particular to Washington DC. We are a vassal country. We do not have anything coming close to a sovereign European voice, let alone a sovereign defense policy. Ireland must maintain its neutrality, which goes hand in hand with the capacity of the people of Ireland to decide who is a war criminal, which nation, country, region deserves your support, even military support. This should be up to you to decide, not up to some prerogative that comes down through the NATO chain of command which is built in order to be undemocratic. It is built in order to deny the people of Ireland and the people of every member state of NATO any say in matters of security, of war and peace. Stay strong, stay neutral. Hello, this is Yanis Varoufakis with a, a message of support and solidarity for my friends at the Institute for Palestinian Studies. As I utter these words, Palestine, Gaza in particular, is uh, being bombarded to smithereens. This is not the time to study the Palestinian issue. This is the time to defend the existence, the very existence of Palestinians, so that uh, the study of the people of Palestine does not become the equivalent of the study of Etruscans or other peoples that have disappeared from the face of the planet. These are difficult days for all of us who care about not just the Palestinians, but the Jews, uh, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, people who are not fashionable victims, because this is where we are today. The West, which is culturally so dominant, uh, has distinguished between fashionable and unfashionable victims. So if you are today a Ukrainian that is being bombed and resists uh, violently, then you're celebrated. But if you are a Yemeni or a Palestinian, you are uh, either bathed in insignificance or uh, bombed even further. My message to those who concentrate on Hamas now is really very simple. Imagine the terror in Tel Aviv and in Washington if Hamas, every single Hamas fighter, were to surrender. Just give up. Say, we were wrong. We're not going to do this anymore. What would they do? The answer is West Bank. Just look at what has been going on in the West Bank, where Hamas is not particularly active and certainly not dominant. Ethnic cleansing galore. The eradication of any possibility of the two-state solution. This is what should concentrate our minds, and this is what we should try to uh, stress and emphasize, uh, because we are in the West, in the world at large, uh, we are experiencing and we are part of a war of propaganda, the purpose of which is to justify fully the state of apartheid 
ethnic cleansing and the annihilation of the people of Palestine. Let's keep fighting. I knew that um, there would be repercussions. One night, it was a Saturday night in 2011, my wife's son arrived home after having been out with friends uh, very late. We hear the thud, we hear his footsteps going towards his bedroom. So we both surrendered to sleep. A few minutes later, the landline rings. Pick up the phone, and there is this suave male voice saying, Mr. Varoufakis, we're very pleased, we, the royal we, we're very pleased that your son has come back from a good night out with friends. I said, who are you? Who is this? And he carried on describing where the nice son had been, naming streets. He finished by saying, if you want him to continue to return safely every night, you better lay off. And he mentioned a particular bank. The next morning, I told my wife what had happened. And she said to me, listen, either you get into politics to protect us, or we get out of the country. So we got out of the country. We migrated to Austin, Texas, of all places. And it was to do with your support for Julian Assange and how that ended up <laughs> costing you, literally, financially. When I was calling the bank, the person on the other side of the phone line would be extremely polite. Oh, Mr. Varoufakis, you are one of our valued customers. and uh, uh, Don't worry, we'll sort out the problem in a jiffy. Until, suddenly, their voice changed. Clearly, they saw something on their screen, and they went absolutely cold. You could hear the fear in their voice, and they would say, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but I cannot help you. If you need to look into this further, call this number. So I jolted down the number and I called the number and there was a telephone service, an answering service. And it said, for the reasons of national security, your account has been suspended indefinitely and you will not be told why and you have no access to um, appeal. That, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And then you think, right, they know no bounds to the exercise of illegitimate power. They just cut you out, and this is a statement of power on their behalf, that you know we can do whatever we want with you. Elon Musk appended the motor car industry, revolutionized space travel. He even dallied in brain-computer interfaces. His high-tech companies made him the richest man in the world, but what they didn't grant him was entry into the new ruling class, harnessing the power of cloud capital. Cloud capital does not produce anything. They are network machines manufactured to modify our behavior. That's what Amazon's Alexa, Apple's Siri, the Google Assistant are. Produced means of behavioral modification. They are machines that train us to train them, to train us, to train them, to train us, to train them, to determine what we want. And once we want it, the same machinery sells it to us directly, bypassing every market. That's the kind of capital Elon Musk never owned. And that is what Musk saw in Twitter. A piece of cloud capital that can hold our attention, manufacture our desires, sell us directly that which will satiate those desires, elicit mass free labor from us while we're clicking away on our screens, and monitor and speed up what workers are doing in the workplace. This is why Elon Musk was interested in Twitter. In short, there is techno-feudal method in Elon Musk's Twitter madness. Capitalism is a remarkable system. On the one hand, it produces remarkable wealth and fantastic technology by which to create more wealth. And on the other hand, it creates new forms of depravity, humiliation, poverty, hopelessness. So hopelessness and poverty and iPhones being created by the same production line. That's capitalism. It's a system that produces its own crisis, that constantly undermines itself. And when there is a crisis, whole generations of people are thrown into the dustbin of history. They get angry. It is at that point that the left's failure to organize 
humanity against the, the misanthropy of capitalism feeds into fascism because fascism is all about harvesting the bitter crop of discontent since our generation's 1929, which of course took place in 2008. The number one task of the establishment was to shift the bankers' losses onto the shoulders of the weakest citizens, effectively transfer huge wealth to the bankers from the have-nots. But austerity leads to very low levels of demand, which leads to very low levels of investment. So you give all this money to the bankers, whether you printed it or actually transferred it, they look at the plebs out there, they realize that oh, these people can't buy their stuff, so they don't invest in production. But what they do is they use the money that has been transferred to them and they buy back their own shares. So their assets go up, share prices, bonuses and so on, house prices go through the roof, and at the same time there's no investment. So this contributes to humanity's failure to do anything about climate change, because unless you invest in green technologies it won't happen. And it also contributes to the perpetuation of the economic disaster that then requires more austerity. But in order to continue along the lines of this catastrophic route, you need more doses of authoritarianism in order to impose those idiotic policies on the many. You have the nationalist international on the one hand and the international of horror on the other, the bankers, large corporations and a political class that has been fed by those oligarchs, groomed by them, lobotomized by them, and of course the media that are owned by the same oligarchs, whose job is to peddle the views of the establishment. But at the same time there is the Nationalist International, which is those who supposedly are full of rage against the international of horror, but who in the end use the discontent that austerity and authoritarianism creates for them to become strongmen. Just like in the 1930s and in the 1920s, the Nazis uh, railed against the bankers, railed against capitalism even, in order to become the lapdogs of uh, the worst of the capitalists. We're talking about the Trumps, the Salvinis, the Farages, the Le Pens, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why the left is the only political force that did not benefit from its capacity to predict uh, the 2008 crisis is because we have a remarkable capacity for disunity, incoherence, fragmentation. Anybody who's watched the first sequences in the life of Brian knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's time that we get our act together, that we organize and emulate the manner in which the fascists and the bankers manage to collaborate internationally. The establishment is astonishing at propaganda. They utilize words like liberty and competition in order to promote exactly the opposite. So what we of the left need to do is we need firstly to expose the hypocrisy and secondly to steal back what was taken away from us. So we need to reclaim liberty when it comes to economic decision-making. Now nobody has any decision-making powers or freedom or choice except for the very, very few who have the capacity to transfer their losses onto the shoulders of everyone else. We need to target three areas. The first one is poverty. We need to create anti-poverty programs and we need to do this through the weaponization of existing institutions like, for instance, in Europe, magnificent profits made by the European Central Bank through its quantitative easing program should be funding the fight against poverty. Second, we need 5% of GDP to be invested in uh, the green transition, immediately. Thirdly, we live in a world where uh, money flows freely and human beings are behind bars. We need to reverse it. We need to have freedom of movement for people and capital controls. We need to revamp the international financial system, the level of the very, very short term, the medium term and the long term. But at the same time, we need to plan for post-capitalism, to force large companies to give a proportion of their shares to a global equity fund, international equity fund, a European one, a British one, a public equity Fund. The privatization of socially produced capital must end and we must begin to socialize socially produced capital. Hope lives eternally in our hearts. We cannot um, do anything about it, thankfully. As long as there is something inside of us which is the core of our humanity, we are going to maintain hope against all evidence because all the evidence is very bleak. But um, we have no right uh, to be empirical about it. Unlike the weather, which is independent of what we think about it, history is made by people who don't give a damn about predictions and who do what they think is right. That night. I allowed myself to enter the Prime Ministerial residence uh, at around midnight, once the result was out. Convinced, it was you know, mind over, over matter, if you want, that it can't be. Alexis must now honor that 62%. I walked into Maximus' residence, the Prime Ministerial residence, together with Anai, my wife. It was like entering a freezer. Suddenly I felt like a foreign body. I could tell that these were people in mourning.
not in celebration. And I remember when the final result was flashed on the television screen in the main uh, living area of the residence. But I jumped up and punched the air and then turned around and realized I was the only one doing it in the room. What really makes the dollar powerful is that the United States is in the red. It keeps buying stuff from China, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, a lot more stuff than what it sells. For, you know, normal countries, when you have a big trade deficit, then you're in trouble. <laughs> then your currency depreciates. Then you have debt crisis. Then the IMF comes to you. And then very soon after that, you lose your schools, your roads, your hospitals. Um, your people are thrown out of their homes. How is it that the United States have managed to turn a trade deficit into the greatest instrument of colonial power in the history of humanity? Because that's what it is. Imagine you are a capitalist in Shanghai and you have a factory producing aluminum. And where do you sell this to? The United, United States. That's whom you send it. Who, whom you send your aluminum to. Why can the, uh, the United States purchaser, buyer, buy it from you? Because the American has dollars and uses dollars to buy uh, your aluminum. This is the trade deficit. The fact that they can keep buying stuff without selling by printing dollars, which says then the Chinese capitalist, what does the Chinese capitalist do with the dollars that he gets from selling aluminum? He takes it to, to Wall Street and there he buys American debt. Therefore, he finances the American government. And he buys real estate. He buys, you know, properties in Miami, in California, in Chicago, in New York. And therefore, you've got this recycling scheme. The reason why the BRICS are not going to be a significant um, threat to the dollar is because Russian capitalists, Chinese capitalists, Indian capitalists, Indonesian capitalists, United Arab Emirates capitalists, they do not want to see the dollar being displaced by any currency, digital, crypto, or normal. They want the dollar to remain completely and utterly dominant because their loot, their wealth is in dollars and it lives in the United States financial system. Who came up with the acronym BRICS? A guy called O'Neill, Jim O'Neill. What was Jim O'Neill? The chief economist of Goldman Sachs. He came up with the idea of the BRICS. He was making the point that if you are investing money, you, you forget about the West. You should invest it in countries like Brazil, in Russia, in China. And in order to make it snazzy, to give it a marketing edge, I asked him, why, why, did, why did you put South Africa in there, the S of BRICS, once I met Jim O'Neill? Do you know what he said to me? Because brick, one brick didn't sound good, and I wanted an S. So he added South Africa in there. So this is the degree of Anglo-European-American dominance. All the developing world is looking at the BRICS as their savior, and the BRICS is an acronym concocted by the chief economist of Goldman Sachs, right? Now, it's not insignificant. It's not insignificant because an increasing amount of international trade is not going to be in dollars. And I think the most interesting event of the last weeks is when we heard that Argentina, repaid a few billion dollars that it owed to the International Monetary Fund using Chinese one. If you couple that with the news that uh, the new development bank, which is the BRICS bank, where Dilma is the president, the former Brazilian president, is going to be lending in local currencies. And also there's another outfit of the BRICS, a separate outfit that is going to try to replace the IMF. So one, when one country, which is associated with the BRICS, let's say South Africa, um, or you know any other country that joins the BRICS in some associative form, when they have a problem with the balance of payments, when they can't repay their bankers in Germany, their bankers in England, their bankers in France, in America, then this BRICS IMF version of the IMF will come in and lend them in local currencies. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to be lent in local currency? Well, when Argentina repaid its IMF 
installment was something like four or five billion dollars using one. All right. What that means is this the Chinese repaid it using their own dollar stock. If they if if this new development bank and the Dilma lends to Argentina or to South Africa or to Zambia, if they lend money in local currency in South Africa rand to the South African government, what does that mean? I mean, the, 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 the BRICS bank does not have rand to give. What it has is dollars, okay? Or one. It can give them one or it can give them dollars. Now, for that loan to South Africa to be useful to South Africa, the South Africans, the South, South African man, uh, government that takes on this loan must be able to buy stuff from America, from Europe, from India. They will have to pay in dollars. So essentially, they get dollars from the BRICS bank, but they have to repay in the future with interest the dollars that it cost initially to give the rand. What does this mean? It means that if the rand devalues 50% in the next 10 years, when the, the loan has to be repaid, this is a good thing for South Africa because South Africa will have inflation. The same quantity of rand in 10 years' time will be worth half as much. So they effectively will have to be repaid to the BRICS bank half the money. So it's negative interest rates for the BRICS bank. Who is going to suffer for this? The Chinese, because they are, only, they are the only ones amongst the BRICS that have a big wad of dollars. So essentially, the BRICS bank means that the Chinese are using their stock of dollars in order to lend the countries that take loans from the BRICS bank and take on itself, Beijing will take on its shoulders, the devaluation risk, which now, when an African country borrows, the devaluation risk is its own. It will have to, to pay for it. Now, why would the Chinese do that? Well, one reason is because they have too many dollars. <laughs> In the sense that, you know, because they have a very large current account surplus, they keep, with every lump of aluminum or car or whatever it is that they all close that they sell to the Americans or to the Europeans, they get dollars back, right? What do they do with these dollars? They have to take them to Wall Street. Now, they've seen what happened after the Ukraine war, that the Central Bank of the United States, the Fed, confiscated 350 billion Russian dollars. So they think, oh, they, can, they may do this to, to, to us. We might as well use our dollars through the BRICS network to gain more influence over South Africa, over Saudi Arabia. So they are socializing amongst the third world, what we used to call the third world, huh? they are dollar holdings. So the BRICS is China. Let's not be, let's not beat about the bush here. The BRICS is China with India uh, trying to find a kind of middle road, with um, the United, United Arab Emirates playing the West against the BRICS uh, in order to gain advantages, like Saudi Arabia wants to negotiate deals. They don't want to get out of the dollar zone, but they want to enhance their relationship with, with China, with the BRICS, in order to leverage their own bargaining with uh, the United States. This is all very interesting. But leftists, I, I'm really appalled. Leftists have a tendency to look at the BRICS and say, this, you know, we'll, we are orphans. We in the left, are, since 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we've been orphaned. We've been looking at a large power internationally that will look after us, that we will be able to dream that they are our people, that they will defeat the capitalist mammoth, right? Don't make this mistake. That's not what the BRICS is. It's significant. I explain why it is significant, but it is not the new communist international, the new socialist international, the new, you know, um, humanist international. That's not what it is. A perpetuity of the right in the government. Like, it doesn't matter how many elections we have, more or less they end up winning and they end up forming a government. And you would think after the crisis and after how the crisis hit Spain, very hard too, like still very high unemployment, 
Um, I, I wanted your your opinion on why is the right still governing in Spain and why a sister party of Syriza has not been able to actually appeal to a wider majority. I'm referring to Podemos. The answer to the question as to why Podemos has reached the ceiling uh, is twofold. One is Europe and the other is Greece. The very close brotherly or sisterly link between Podemos and Syriza mm -hmm. after the crashing of Syriza in 2015 was a natural um, downer for Podemos. But Europe is also a problem. I think it's a bigger problem, to, to put it very bluntly. Uh, I think that the, the average Spaniard who might be interested in voting for Podemos wants Pablo Iglesias and his comrades to answer the question, so what are you going to do in the Eurogroup once you're elected? Hmm. And I don't think that Podemos have even paid sufficient attention to think about this question, which is exactly the opposite of what we at DiEM25 are doing, which is constantly this question, what should happen at the European level, in the interest not of just of the Spaniards, or the Greeks, or the Germans, but Europeans. Going to the question about uh, the right. The right. Mm -hmm. This is very similar to Greece, as, you're, as you yeah. said. Traditional social democracy saw itself as the arbiter between industrial capital and labor. Their job was to sit around the table, the bargain negotiations table between trade unions and employers, and find some accommodation. Facilitate the freedom of the manager, while at the same time safeguarding workers for the rights. Mm -hmm. And at the same time taking a chunk of profits, of surplus value, as we economists say, and use it to fund the welfare state. This is what social yeah. democracy yeah. was all about. Absolutely. But with financialization from the beginning of the 1980s, the role of industrial capital has shrunk and the role of financial capital has increased. And it was happening at the time of deregulation. And suddenly there was this cacophony of money making in the financial sector and social democratic leaders were lured by this cacophony and they made a Faustian bargain with financiers. And it was very simple. We will turn a blind eye, let you do whatever you want, and you'll fund us. Us meant fund the welfare state, fund our political parties, our own personal campaigns, so when the financial pyramids that, that were built as a result of this crashed in 2008, 2009, those social democrats no longer had either the analy analytical capacity or the moral backbone to pick up the phone and say to the bankers, you know, you're finished. We're going to save your bank, but we're not going to save you. And instead, they, in, in, they, they started rolling backwards yeah. all protections to, to, to the working class and carrying out austerity on behalf of the, the, this cynical transfer from the books of the banks to the books of the transfer. Yeah. Okay? And, and therefore, they lost all legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And th the right was left without contest. Without opposition. Yeah. Yeah. I think the left has a more fundamental problem, actually. So if you look at, at Britain, for example, uh, the Brexit vote, you had a lot of Labour voters who actually voted for Brexit and um, casted their vote because they had lost their trust in the elite of London, the elite of government, and it was a, actually a, a Tory government at that time. So it was not this uh, uh, classic uh, uh, clash between a left and right in this case. Um, same thing in the US. You had a kind of a liberal leader with, with Barack Obama, and then you had a lot of blue collar voters who actually voted right wing, uh, uh, voted for Donald Trump. So I think that there's a more fundamental question for the European left, why are most of their supporters or a lot of their supporters actually turned right and not left in the time of need? Well, let's make a sharp distinction between the populist right that Brexiteers voted for mm -hmm. and Americans voted for in, in, in the that's case of Trump from right-wing governments like the one of the Popular Party, yeah. which is an establishment mm -hmm. party mm -hmm. in Spain. They're not the same thing. Yeah, that's so true. passion has returned to politics on the, what I call the militant parochial nativist nationalist international, <laughs> uh, who are not the Christian Democrats in Germany, who are not the Popular Party in, 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 in Spain. I know a lot of American, uh, American friends who actually voted for Trump and I couldn't believe it that they would vote for Trump and they would say to me things like, well, we just ask ourselves a, a simple question. How can we uh, annoy the establishment that treated us this <laughs> yeah. way yeah. Yeah. through the ballot box? Mm -hmm. Similarly in Britain. Similarly in Britain. I do not believe that people really care about the European Union so much. Mr. Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, has made the mint out of lockdown. He amassed more than $85 billion during lockdown. Amazon is not just any business. 
it represents a major break, even from capitalism. It's not just Amazon, of course, it's Facebook, it's Netflix, the whole of the fangs. Back in the 1920s, even the American establishment, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, rose up against the huge trusts, the large corporations. Remember the antitrust legislation that broke down Rockefeller's standard oil mega firm that was monopolizing the market for oil in the United States. So there's nothing new about complaining about cartels and large operations like uh, Standard Oil, like Amazon. What is new about Amazon is um, the reach of the monopoly. It's one thing to say that, you know, you are walking down the high street in an English town or a main street in an American town and you've got one large shop owned by a chain that effectively monopolizes everything, like Walmart. But imagine a situation where you're walking down the street and the asphalt, the pavement, the benches, the lampposts, the walls, the houses, every shop that there is, uh, the post office, the air you breathe, the water that you drink from a tap, everything is owned by one company. That is what big tech are doing. It is this immense concentration of wealth which leads to a situation where somebody like Jeff Bezos can practically, to all intents and purposes, become richer during his sleep. That is the situation we are facing today. Wealth begets wealth, courtesy of being concentrated. Not because of innovation, not because of any contribution. Look, Jeff Bezos deserves to be rich. He's a smart entrepreneur. He's had this idea a long time ago. He looked at the internet. He thought, okay, now what can I sell over the internet in a context that cannot be replicated by the analog world? And he thought, okay, books. He didn't give a damn about books but he thought of them as items. As he says in a famous video, there are three million books constantly in print worldwide. There can be no bookshop that sells three million books, but there can be an Amazon.com from which you can actually purchase any of these three million books. So that was a clever idea. So yeah, I don't begrudge him the fact that he's rich. But you know what? $200 billion plus cannot be explained as a result of innovation. It is a kind of feudalism. It's a kind of techno-feudalism. It's courtesy of the fact that he owns the whole thing. <laughs> the main street, the high street, the complete thing. And the result, of course, is such exorbitant power leads to immense exploitation of workers who work like robots in warehouses under conditions that are not fit for robots. The environment, just look at the facts and the figures. The carbon footprint of Amazon is you know, greater than two-thirds of countries around the world. Look at taxation. They pay no tax, 0% corporation tax. <laughs> and they do this completely legally. We need to send a message to Jeff Bezos. But you know, Mr. Bezos, the days of immunity and impunity are over.